Of all the disasters that can happen to an aircraft, probably none is more terrifying than a sudden high-speed near-vertical descent into the ground. Hi, I'm aviation journalist Jeff Wise, and today we're going to talk about nosedives and why they can happen. All this, of course, is in the context of last Friday's Learjet 55 crash in Philadelphia. This was a Learjet 55 that took off from Northeast Philadelphia Airport. Uh, while the medevac mission, it had climbed up to 1,650 feet and then suddenly turned and dove straight into a busy, crowded neighborhood, killing one person on the ground and at last count, 19 injured. So why did this happen? We don't know right now. This kind of accident is actually one of the more difficult to try to solve because that impact can be so violent that it just shreds all of the evidence. So we're not gonna have a lot of the clues that many crashes have. And frankly, it's possible that we might not ever figure out exactly what happened. So I wanted to go through today some of the causes generally that we see in planes suddenly taking a nosedive into the ground but again, it's very preliminary, and I don't want to say that, you know, this is, I'm not trying to tell you what happened to this plane, but this is how this kind of accident can occur. Just a few details about the case as we know it so far. The plane was a Mexican registered Learjet 55, which is a type of aircraft that was built during the 80s. So it was a pretty old aircraft. It was run by a company called Jet Rescue Air Ambulance which specialized in taking medical patients back and forth between Latin America and the United States for medical treatment. There were six people on board, the two flight crew, uh, a doctor and a medical technician, as well as a young female patient and the patient's mother. Although it was a pretty old aircraft, this is not an aircraft type that has been involved in a particularly large amount of accidents. This company, however, had been involved in a fatal accident before. Back in 2023, one of its jets uh, had a fatal crash in Morelos, Mexico. So let's talk about the flight. The plane took off, climbed quite briskly up through a cloud base of 400 feet. So it was in the soup almost immediately, climbed up to 1,650 feet with its rate of ascent slowly declining, and then it turned into a dive. It came back down out of the clouds and struck the ground almost instantly later, creating this enormous fireball. It's worth remembering that this plane was heavily loaded with fuel uh, for this thousand mile trip. And a fully loaded Learjet 55 has about as much chemical energy in it as a full bomb load for a World War II B-17 bomber. So there's a tremendous amount of potential energy it's kind of a miracle, frankly, that more people weren't killed and injured on the ground because this could have been a really devastating event. Let's get to the main question, which is what accounts for this kind of behavior of an airplane? What can make a plane go from an otherwise normal flight to suddenly plunging at terrific speed into the ground, killing everyone aboard? The first kind of cause for this sort of accident that I want to talk about is pilot disorientation. Now, remember, when this plane took off, it immediately climbed into the clouds. All that the pilot could see was shades of gray, black, white. Everything is very hazy and amorphous. There's no way to know where you are. And in daily life, we're really used to having our inner ear senses align with what we see with our eyes. And when the visual reference is removed, we can really easily be fooled by our inner ear sensation. Any acceleration, whether it be a turn or uh, an increase in engine thrust, can be perceived as a change in going up or going down. Famous example of spatial disorientation in instrument meteorological conditions, meaning in the clouds, um, was the crash uh, that Kobe Bryant and his companions suffered um, their pilot was flying them in a helicopter through a mountain pass, was basically forced up into the cloud layer. And the pilot clearly thought that he was going to just climb through the layer and up into clear air above. Instead, he got disoriented. He wasn't paying close enough attention to his instruments, got into a bank. And part of the disorienting, uh, disorienting effect of a bank is that that centrifugal force 
just feels like downward force. So he might have felt like he was going straight up. Actually, he had gotten into a bank. It turned into a spiral dive. By the time they came out of the bottom of the clouds, they were just seconds away from impact. There was no time to correct. So everyone on board was killed in that case. There's another kind of disorientation that can occur when you're surrounded by clouds, and that is called the somatographic illusion. This has to do with acceleration um, caused by the increase of engine thrust. A famous example of this occurred in 2019 when a Boeing 767 that was carrying cargo for the U.S. Postal Service was coming into land at Houston. The weather was stormy. There was clouds. There was precipitation around. The controllers were helping the plane maneuver around some precipitation when the plane apparently hit some turbulence. And we don't know exactly why. Maybe the flight crew was trying to escape a sudden downdraft or something. But for some reason, they pushed the throttle forward. There was a sudden acceleration. And perhaps because the pilot perceived that acceleration as a sharp climb, they pushed the control yoke aggressively forward. And that put the plane into a dive. They plummeted from 6,000 feet to impact with the ground in just 18 seconds. Now, you can see that that might apply here. The plane was climbing. The Learjet is very powerful. Um, it, it, it is possible that that acceleration caused them to think that they were pitching up more than they should. Um, now, normally you would expect experienced pilots to understand that this illusion exists and they should focus their attention quite rigorously on the instruments to tell them what to do. Um, but it's really, we just don't know. The, the human mind is so difficult and really impossible to decipher. Okay, let's talk about another way that a plane can get into a nosedive. And this is navigation equipment failure. So as we've discussed, when you're in the soup, when you can't uh, have any ref uh, visual reference to the ground, you have to trust your instruments. What if you don't trust your instruments? What if your instruments aren't trustworthy? What if something goes wrong with them? The different kinds of instruments that a pilot will traditionally rely on to know which direction they're pointed is called the attitude indicator. And this is a very familiar piece of equipment that sits in the panel in front of the pilot. And it looks like a rotating globe and the blue is, is, is up and the brown is down. A newer piece of equipment that modern aircraft are equipped with is called the flight director. It tells you how you should manipulate the controls to remain on the course that you wanna be on. And this is fed by information coming from a piece of equipment called an ADARU, which is an air data inertial reference unit. And this combines information coming from things like pitot tube and, and it combines that with um, accelerometer data. And it really kind of generates a comprehensive picture of where the plane is and how it's oriented in space and time. The ADARU is so crucial to safe navigation under instrument meteorological conditions that they come in triplicate form. You've got multiple redundancy so that if one fails, you've got two others that you can rely on because it's absolutely critical that you be able to trust your instruments, but they do sometimes fail. And when they fail, it can lead to really catastrophic outcomes. One example of this was a, a crash that occurred in 2016 when a Swedish cargo jet that was flying to Tromsø, Norway in the middle of the night, it was January. You can imagine how dark and cold it must have been. Um, but as it was just in cruise phase, just kind of humming along, a faulty Adaru led the plane's flight controller to erroneously tell the pilots that the plane was flying to nose high. Again, when you're in instrument conditions, you can't really second guess your instruments. You just have to follow what they say. So the pilots pushed the plane into a steep dive. Um, it actually entered a negative G dive so that they were hanging in their straps um, and the plane in short order impacted the snowy tundra at almost 600 miles per hour. Let's talk about a third way that planes can nosedive, and that is mechanical failure. You know, a modern high-speed aircraft is really a miracle of performance. You've got tremendous uh, thrust forces generated by the engine. Um, you've got lift that is balanced by weight. And all of this has to be balanced 
and counteracted so that the plane doesn't fly off course. And this is achieved by complex machinery. And if one element of that machinery breaks, then everything could come apart very quickly. One of the pieces of equipment that is really crucial to a plane to keep on course is the horizontal stabilizer and the elevator. If a plane loses its tail, there really is nothing to prevent the plane's center of gravity from pulling the nose down towards the ground in a way that you can't recover from. An example of this took place in 1991 when a Continental Express turboprop was flying from Laredo, Texas to Houston. Part of the left horizontal stabilizer came flying off as a result of poor slipshod maintenance. Um, this particular plane, it was an Embraer 120 Brasilia. It had a history of mechanical issues. It had been sent for unscheduled repair uh, 33 times prior to the accident. And just before the flight, maintenance workers had replaced de-icing boots on the horizontal stabilizer, but they hadn't replaced all of the screws. And so when the part broke off, uh, the plane you know, lost enough of its tail that it went into a negative G dive uh, and that the pressures of dive tore one of its wings partially off, fuel escaped, the fuel ignited, this plane went down in a fireball, all 14 aboard were killed. The, the good news about all this, it was a really horrific crash and kind of woke people up. And as a result, the FAA made a significant rule change and, and that kind of problem has been reduced as a result. Okay, final kind of nosedive that we're going to talk about today, and that is suicide. Um, you know, you can improve operational procedures, you can improve manufacturing standards all you want, but there's always going to be one component of the aviation system that is just fundamentally prone to, to errors of a kind that's, you know, at some level fundamentally impossible to understand. And so, impossible to completely prevent. Um, and, and that is just the human mind. Sometimes people snap and sometimes they do that while they're at the controls of an airplane. A recent example of this happened in October of 2023 uh, when an off-duty pilot named Joseph Emerson, he was deadheading on an Alaska Airlines flight from Everett, Washington to San Francisco. And he snapped. He suddenly reached forward. He, he tried to deploy the engine's fire suppression system, which would have put out the engine and, you know, there would have been no threat. The plane would have turned into a glider. It's not really the most effective way to try to commit suicide um, because the plane still would have, you know, flight controls and everything. It, it would be possible to recover from this, but um, Emerson was kind of wrestled into submission by the flight crew and he later told police that he'd been hallucinating and that while this was going on, he told himself, this isn't real. I need to wake up. That was a sort of happy ending. They, they managed to wrestle him into the submission before he could kill everybody. Um, that obviously hasn't always been the case. These things are rare, but they have happened. One of the most high profile was in 1997, the pilot of a 737 that was flying from Jakarta, Indonesia, he got up from his seat. He went out of the cockpit. There was a panel of uh, circuit breakers just there, and he pulled the circuit breaker for the black boxes, went back to his seat, pushed the plane down into a nosedive. And it was such a steep dive that the plane briefly went supersonic and pieces were kind of ripped off the plane because it was so far above its maximum design speed. Um, it went from 35,000 feet to an impact with a river called the Musi River in Indonesia in less than a minute. Um, all 104 people were killed, obviously. Uh, the plane and its occupants were just so completely shredded that not a single body was found intact. Some of the pieces of the plane were embedded up to 15 feet into the, the bed of the river. So just an absolutely catastrophic event. Again, when you hit the ground that hard, it is 
so devastating and and just rips everything into literally a million pieces it can be really hard for accident investigators to later go back and try to recreate what happened of course in this case things were calc were complicated by the fact that even though the plane had black boxes that were recovered and data was recovered from them the black boxes had been turned off and so obviously this puts suspicion on the pilot but we'll never really know with 100 percent certainty what 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 was going on in that situation so those are four different kinds a non-exhaustive list of things that can put a plane into a nosedive um of all of them which one seems most likely i would it's i would say it doesn't seem like suicide because it happened so soon after takeoff also i think if you were flying a sick little girl back to her home i just i i, I think that cuts against the idea of just having this nihilistic desire for self-destruction so i think that's not particularly likely um could there have been a mechanical failure i would say probably not um just because it happened so soon after takeoff. And for a similar reason, I think the failure of the navigational system probably isn't the most likely. It does seem to my mind most like a disorientation incident where the pilot just having climbed up into the clouds really quickly got turned around, couldn't tell which way was up. For whatever reason, either didn't look at the instruments or didn't trust them and got disoriented and got into a plunge. By the time they came out of the bottom of the clouds, there just wasn't enough time to correct. Hopefully, somehow investigators will be able to piece together some picture. I don't know if they will. And this this was a bad one. And I, I think people were especially primed to react to this accident because it came just two days after the first fatal accident involving a commercial airliner in the United States since 2009. And of course, a lot of other crazy things are happening in the United States right now. There's a general sense of everything going topsy-turvy and what can we trust. There have been attacks on the integrity of the civil aviation system in this country. Um, I won't get into that detail right now. I don't need to get political right here, but we can say that there are legitimate grounds to be concerned about air safety in this country in a way that hasn't really been the case in my lifetime. I think we really need to pay close attention to what's happening and hopefully speak up and stand up if things are done to the civil aviation system in this country that are going to be harmful for safety. Because we need to keep this, this system safe. We all rely on it and we can't let it be tampered with. So. That's what I have for you today. Again, if you support this podcast, uh, please, uh, you can go over to the Substack at findingma370.com. If you join there, you can pay to be a member, and that is really helpful to me. Uh, you can also uh, sign up for a paid subscription to the YouTube channel right here. So that's all I have for you today. Thanks very much. This is Jeff Wise. I will see you next time. Take care.